The world's best rocket scientist isn't the world's best marine biologist. Just like the world's strongest man probably couldn't nail Swan Lake. Being a specialist means not being great at lots of other things. It takes dedicated focus. But that sort of focus is out of fashion. Today, everyone wants to be a generalist. Not at NetApp. We're proud to be specialists. We don't make laptops. You don't want us to create a TV show? Seriously. We can't do what our customers do. What we do is provide the most cutting edge and remarkable cloud storage services on the planet, which might not make us a great DJ. But it does let us help you access your data in the right place at the right time. There's plenty of things we can't do, but we can connect your cloud to on-prem and have them get along like BFFs. BFFs that reduce costs and improve data availability, obviously. Cooking Michelin star food? Sorry. Analyzing data to maximize your security and maintain compliance? Take a seat. Puppy training? No. Optimizing application performance in data centers and on the cloud? Good boy. It's all we think about. Unlocking more than you ever thought possible from your cloud. So when you're thinking about cloud storage, why just be in good hands? When you can be in the mother flipping specialist's hands. The cloud storage specialists. NetApp. Hello and welcome to the NetApp Amplify series, a virtual space and place where we bring together some of the sharpest minds in tech to deep dive into our industry's biggest challenges. Today, we uncover best practices in healthcare and specifically how organizations are mitigating risk, increasing patient provider and associate satisfaction and increasing efficiency all while decreasing costs and complexity. Sensitive, unique and life-saving, data is the figurative lifeblood of healthcare. But how do you balance the needs of patients and staff in such a heavily regulated industry? Well, with faster diagnoses and proven care pathways, technology is truly shaping healthcare with innovations that are fortifying the industry and heavily influencing others. That's what we're gonna get into today. Uh, before we do that, we do have some minor housekeeping notes to go through. We're using the Zoom platform today, uh, as I'm sure that everyone is familiar with over the last 12 months. We would ask you to be respectful to the other attendees in your session, of course. Um, keep your mics muted throughout the session to keep the conversation flowing and your camera feed is off by default. Um, please feel free to, to keep it that way. There will be time for Q&A with our presenters. If you can use the chat function, um, that is there in Zoom to post your questions. Uh, we'll circle back um, throughout and towards the end um, to speak to them. If you could ensure that you address your question to the relevant speaker, be it Paul or Chris, uh, we'll make sure that we give it the time that it needs. And of course, if for any reason you need to leave the session, um, you can click the red leave meeting button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So moving on um, today's agenda, uh, relatively brief agenda, but a lot to get through, we have two incredibly experienced guest speakers. Uh, they will be exploring data in the healthcare industry and more specifically, what makes healthcare data so different from corporate data and how do you balance the needs of patients and staff in such a heavily regulated industry and how technology has changed and shaped healthcare and what can we expect in the future? And of course, uh, as is always the case, I'm sure they'll cover a whole heap more. He is the Associate Professor of Public Health and the Director of the Centre for Health Stewardship at the Australian National University. Um, joining us today will be Mr. Paul Dugdale uh, to help in grounding a lot of this con content, I would say, and actionable insights. Uh, we're joined by NetApp's very own Technical Partner Manager, Chris Gondek. Those gents will be back with us shortly. Um, to make sure that everyone's all engaged and ready and open and participating, we have a little we have a little session for you to kick things off. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes running through some trivia, um, some very special net app trivia that the elves in the back end have put together. There are some prizes on offer, um, so I would encourage you to do your best. Um, we obviously hope that uh, there's no cheating, but we're not going to stop you. So. Uh, the more the merrier. There is a QR code there. You can feel free to scan that with your mobile device now. That will take you to the landing page um, for our trivia session. Or 
the elves will have posted the hyperlink in the chat, which you can use to open in your browser. Uh, when you've done that, you'll see the landing page there is asking for your full name. We'd ask for your full name, um, uh, English or, or, or your native language. Uh, it's totally fine. And that way we can make sure that the prizes get to the right people. There are a few prizes, so uh, make sure that you correctly enter your name there. I'm sure that everyone here is very well equipped in the IT space, so I won't give you too much more time. I'm going to assume that you are all logged in and have read the How to Play. It's a live game. There'll be a live leaderboard. Uh, six questions, I believe, the elves have for me. Um, and of course, it's multi-choice, so pretty straightforward. I would hope that uh, at least uh, Chris should ace this one, I should hope. Um, but for the rest of you, do your best and uh, we'll release the scores at the end. So um, I assume everyone's ready. Uh, let's get on this, this bus and leave the station. If the elves could bring up the first question in today's net app trivia game, we will get underway. The first question is, what is the color of the net app logo? Is it A, purple, B, blue, C, black, or D, pink? Now, critically, for those of you who've been keeping a close eye, NetApp recently went through a very beautiful brand refresh. So it's going to be one of those four. Um, you will have gotten a clue on some of the previous slides. Chris is wearing <laughs> maybe helpful shirt, maybe not so helpful shirt. Um, quick fingers. That's question one. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Let's move on, elves, um, to question two. And there's the answers, right? Blue or black? Well, we've, we've got a split audience, Chris. So I think you've thrown uh, a bit of a curveball there with your blue shirt. We'll have to get the brand team uh, to ship you a very fresh one. But no, the NetApp rebrand has gone to black. So congrats to those that did get that right. On to question two now. Question two, what, is the, what was the original founding name of NetApp? Was it Net Application, Network Application, network appliance or net app they are the possible answers and elves i think we're going to have to do a quick countdown because i'm sure that everyone is madly googling in the back end so we'll lock it off in five four three two and one that was question two the answers hopefully you got your answers in in time well done 60 percent um, no, no disrespect to the other guys. They were, it was a very admirable answer, but unfortunately incorrect in this instance. Network app, app, uh, Appliance was, of course, the original name for NetApp. Moving on to question three. Oh, I can see there are some quick fingers there that are going to do well. NetApp Data Fabric simplifies the complexity of what? Is it artificial intelligence, hybrid multi-cloud, applications, or security? So... The NetApp data fabric simplifies the complexity of what? And again, we'll count it down to stop the quick fingers in five, four, three, two, and one. That's the end. And we're halfway. We're halfway through. Well done. Hybrid and multi-cloud. So I can see we've either got some existing customers on Chris or some people that are very ready um, to go on a cloud storage journey with you. Um, using that particular service and product. So that's question three. Halfway, like I said, I suspect there are quite a few people tied at the top. So let's sort through the remaining questions. Else, Question four is NetApp Data Fabric keeps your data at the heart of your business for you to what? Realize the promise of cloud, develop and deploy your applications faster, accelerate your journey to AI or all of the above. I suspect I know the answer without knowing too much about NetApp Data Fabric, but I will defer to our audience members in five, four, three, two, and one. Well done, all of the above. I tried to uh, not have too much inflection on that to make it obvious, um, but congrats to those that did do that. Of course, NetApp Data Fabric does all of those things. Um, and probably more, Chris, and you can dive into that a little later. That's question four. Question five, two remaining. Wow, getting to the pointy end. When was NetApp founded? Was it in 91, 92, 93, or 94? Now, I hope you can guess in five, four, three, two, one. 
Let me close that off. That is question five. Well done. Half and half. Knowing the luck, it will have been on December 31st, 92. No, don't take my word for that. It was in 1992. So that makes you a uh, 31-year-old company now. Well done. Cracking through. Still young, still young, all things considered, but plenty of experience there in a digital native industry. So the final question. Question six. Is NetApp an industry leader for multi-cloud? Now, I really hope there isn't a tie and somebody gets this wrong to drop them back out of the lead. I'll give you all the time you need to consider this one, but I think it's pretty straightforward. So I'll give you three, two, and one to answer that. Well done. It is an industry leader for multi-cloud. Chris, I hope that wasn't you in the false category there. So elves, I suspect we have a leaderboard I'm really hoping there aren't eight who have tied for the top, but there is three tied for the top. Well done, Gonzo, Michael, Boyd, and Fred Dye. You are taking home first prize, Carol and SS. Team, I hope we can establish who SS is. Um, if not, maybe we'll use a chat function to, to establish that. But congratulations to our top five who are taking home some prizes today. Um, our L's will reach out to you with those prizes in due course. So. That's not what we're here today for, albeit we all love a bit of swag. We are here to hear from some two very experienced industry leaders. Uh, the first, of course, is our guest speaker. Paul Dugdale is an Associate Professor of Public Health and Director at the Centre for Health Stewardship at the Australian National University. He's worked for many years as a staff specialist with Canberra Health Services in various positions, including Chief Medical Officer, Director of Chronic Disease Management and Executive Director of Medical Services. He has experience in the operational executive management of a chronic disease management register, radiology system, pathology system, electronic medication management system, and in the acquisition of an electronic health record system, something that I'm sure that all of our attendees today will be thrilled to kind of dive into. Uh, he's an incredibly experienced senior executive. He joins us from the outskirts of Canberra on his property, where that background of his is actually facing out. Uh, and many of his team have been using NetApp's products for years. We're thrilled to welcome him. It's Mr. Paul Dugdale. And joining Hello. him. Morning, Chris, or morning, Paul, should I say, or afternoon for those of you in the Eastern Seaboard. Joining Paul um, is Chris Gondek. He plays a role as a technical partner manager at NetApp in Australia and New Zealand. In his role, Chris engages with the NetApp partner community at a strategic and at a technical level, enabling the community to help businesses unify their data strategies across the hybrid multi-cloud. For more than two decades, Chris has specialized in data and information management, storage, high availability and disaster recovery solutions, including virtualization, hyper-converged infrastructure and cloud computing, and has extended recently into artificial intelligence. As an industry thought leader and passionate technology evangelist, Chris frequently blogs all things data and is active in the technology community. His mission in life is to help businesses of all shapes and sizes to become their own data champions. So without further ado, I will hand over to these wonderfully esteemed gentlemen. Please make welcome Chris Gondek and Mr. Paul Dugdale. Fantastic, Andrew. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, first and foremost, am I coming through loud and clear for everyone? You are indeed. Yeah, not awesome. Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us on this uh, Amplify session today uh, around uh, healthcare. Our focus is healthcare and the healthcare industry. And I'm thrilled to have uh, Paul with us today, who's very kindly uh, given some of his time to come and talk to us about his experience uh, throughout the healthcare industry, as well as technology and business and costs and finance and all of these things that come together um, will help us kind of get an insight into your world, Paul, and, and the challenges that you faced and, and the kind of innovations that you've seen. Um, I'd like to start with a few questions, if I may. And um, my very first question, seeing as we are you know, a data company uh, and uh, we're dealing with uh, emerging technology in healthcare, I'd like to ask what makes healthcare data so different from corporate data? Yeah, it's a, an important question for, for working in the health sector because the health sector is often thought of as a, a lagging sector for IT. Um, but I, I don't think that's actually right. I think it's a complex sector for IT 
and to be in it, you've got to be right at the front. The, the first uh, point to make is that health data has a lot of categories. Um, so, you know, there's thousands of different diseases. There's thousands of different physiological parameters. Uh, you know, your average blood test might have 30 different uh, chemicals uh, that they're looking at. Um, whereas, say, if we, we compare it to banking, banking is essentially got two variables. There's yeah. people and there's money. And if your uh, computing system can deal with people and with money, you know, you should be able to sort out something pretty. You can, pretty you can get by. There. There's, there's not a lot of data there or, or, or data categories there, right? Yeah. Whereas in health, uh, there's just so many different categories. And uh, for those, uh, those of the people in the audience who've done a bit of statistics, uh, we all know that it gets really complex when you get into categorical data analysis uh, and away from simple linear analysis. The second thing uh, that follows from this huge number of categories is that interpretation of health data requires pattern recognition across a very wide number of variables. Now, interpretation of data is always about pattern re recognition. Um, but when you're having to look for patterns across a, a wide range of different variables, it's much harder to find those patterns than if you're just looking across a, a single variable mm -hmm. and looking at, well, you know, what are the patterns over time or, or across our different uh, customers. And the, the third uh, complexity, I guess, and difference from corporate data is that although in corporate data, we're always concerned with, with um, you know, being good corporate citizens, and that means not giving people's data away and not selling it unless that's what they've uh, engaged you to do. In health, it's a highly regulated environment and it's, there's a lot of problems with data liquidity. So typically hospitals have absolutely enormous data holdings spread across a very wide number of databases and getting the data flowing between them, the liquidity of the data mm -hmm. in the healthcare environment is inherently complex because there's so many different categories and databases. And it's actually legally complex because of that highly regulated environment. So there's three answers. And we might just bring up the, the summary of that. Health data has got more categories, interpretation is difficult, and the liquidity is, is a problem. That's interesting that you raised those points, um, Paul, because uh, I guess if I think about corporate data and mishandling of corporate data, what are the consequences of that, right? I might get a slap on the wrist. I might get a warning. At worst, I might lose my job. What are some of the consequences of mishandling uh, healthcare data, which, as you mentioned uh, just now, is highly regulated and can contain very sensitive information? Yeah, I, I often say to um, my students, we bring them in and they might be medical students or they might be uh, doing uh, some doctoral research and we get them enabled onto the main um, electronic health record systems of the hospital and say to them, you can look up a lot of parliamentarians' medical records if they've ever been to our hospital. You know, I live in Canberra, people turn up at our service. And wouldn't that be interesting to know about their personal medical history? And they go, oh, gee, I didn't know I could do that. I said, yeah, there's not actually a block. Suddenly this power you at your up. fingertips, right? <laughs> and I said, but if you do, you will never work in this industry again. We will deregister you. You will never finish your course. And there will be a police investigation and you may be charged with uh, criminally yeah. breaking the, the health laws. So it's, it's high stakes for health data because it's so personal. Wow. That's, so you've raised a, a very important point there. So one of the key differences, I guess, um, between uh, you know, corporate data and healthcare data is that uh, 
it's obviously uh, a lot more heavily regulated, but um, it has more categories than other industries. You, you've you've um, brought that up. There are so many different permutations. This categorical analysis. Um, you know, if if we take um, an X-ray, there's so much metadata associated with that data. You know, it's like I think about my digital camera. I take a photo. It might. T- um, take the date and the time where it was taken, the size of the picture. Then when you take an x-ray, you've got things like blood type, you've got patient name, you've got all these other, you know, uh, I guess, uh, attributes um, of, of healthcare data. You talked about, you know, this um, interpretation, the pattern recognition, the wide range of variables. I mean, you, you, you nailed it on the head there, like even a blood test sample, all of the different um, kind of uh, tests you run it through and you run it at will come out with all these variables. But um, I really like that third point that you mentioned there, that liquidity of data is difficult to achieve because it's highly regulated. In a business, I can open up data repositories between departments without fear of breaking some sort of law or compliance or governance um, for, uh, I guess, um, uh, collaboration. But as much as the healthcare specialists want to do that, <laughs> they're bound by these uh, by these laws. That's that's a fantastic answer. Thank you. So my next question, I guess, then kind of leads in from that question is, you know, what technology challenges does the healthcare industry face that uh, can't be addressed the way other businesses can? So we know the difference between the data. What about your ability to adopt technologies? Yeah. So there's a lot of technology in healthcare. Uh, as I say, it's not a lag sector. It's a leading edge sector and it's a big sector. So there's a lot of technology that you're coming into the environment with. And the healthcare environment demands interoperability across many applications, um, even though there's this difficulty uh, with the regulation and with the data sharing. Yeah. So uh, without interoperability, the power of any particular application will be extremely limited and the efficiency of it will be very limited. So for example, if it's not interoperating with uh, the identity system, then you're gonna have to have people put in the the identity of the patient again. Um, Whereas if you can look that up on the main system, uh, firstly, you get better matching every time you put in somebody's identity, you know, you get their street name wrong or their date of birth, you have a, a, a substitution of, of one number for another. Um, so it's, if you have interoperability, you get greater accuracy and greater efficiency and your clients will demand it. And those health sector clients, the clinicians and the clinical service managers they rarely want off the shelf applications with a minimum installation. So this is just part of the healthcare environment. You've got to have a, uh, got to be up for a conversation with them about how you can make your, um, your product or, or your offering fit with what they want. Um, very occasionally, you know, I mean, a word processor, they'll probably be happy with, with uh, Microsoft Word, but um, clinical applications, they want bespoke installations as a minimum, and they may well want additional functionality. Uh, you raise a really good point uh, there, Paul. Who's going to argue with them? I can't come in and say, no, sorry, I'm not going to give you that because I, I don't have 10 plus years of experience in the medical field. We're just going to have to give them what they ask for, right? Well, <laughs> you know, on the other hand, they often don't have the experience with, uh, with IT, and they don't realize how powerful a lot of current offerings are. And so they assume that they're gonna to have to get some coders in to build them stuff. Whereas what they really need is a, a sensitive uh, and uh, sensible installation of, of whatever the offering is. So you, you, you have to be able to hold your own in the conversation with them. I, I guess a, another point to make about them is that in the health sector, the staff there are very cunning. They've been working with IT systems and with paper-based systems before that for a very, very long time. They know what they wanna do and they will come up with a workaround to do something if it's not immediately obvious how to do it. And that cunningness, that adaptability um, and the use of workarounds to get what they need for their clinical care is just part of the uh, 
part of the landscape. I'll uh, tell you a brief story about that. I um, was working away in, in medical administration uh, at one stage and I had a delegation from the chief information officer and he came and they came and they said, we've discovered a huge problem. I said, what's that? Tell me about it. He said, a lot of the junior doctors are communicating with each other using WhatsApp. And ah. I said, sure, uh, what's the problem? I said, well, they're sharing patient information across WhatsApp and it's like not an authorized system. We've never said they're allowed to do that and they're just doing it. I said, okay, so I guess you're gonna tell me that I have to go and tell them to stop. And they said, no, we thought of that. That was our first reaction. And then we had a look at just how much traffic there was. And we realized that if we said stop, the hospital would grind to a halt and wow. people would probably die. Wow, so there you go. You can't tell them to stop. So we don't know what to do. So, And that's quite uh, topical did. right now. WhatsApp's been in the news recently for changing its privacy policy. And, uh, yeah. um, you know, and, and it, you know, that, that is a classic example of shadow IT. You know, things that um, will happen as a result of a need where they can't rely on corporate IT to deliver. So, you know, end users, like you say, they're, they're, they're smart, they're cunning, they're survivalists, and uh, they will come up with their own solutions, whether IT sanctions it or not, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't see it as a huge, uh, as an existential problem. But mm. if you're going to use, you know, whatever platform for sharing healthcare data, you have to be aware of the um, legislation, you have to be aware mm. of your policies of your organization, and you have to comply with them. It's the same on the phone. You can use the phone. We've been using phones in hospitals for years. Yeah. Um, but if you tell somebody you shouldn't, something that they shouldn't know, then you know that's, that's not on. So it's all about being adaptable, but being sensitive to the environment. So I guess that's a, you know, a wrap up on, on your second question that, You've got to have interoperability between applications. You're not going to be able to come with things straight off the shelf and you've got to face a pretty cunning client. Interesting. So, and, and I think my mindset when I came up with this question, when I thought, what am I going to ask Paul? You know, what, what, how am I going to find out um, what sort of things he's uncovered throughout his career? And I immediately thought the advent of cloud. I thought when cloud came out, could the healthcare vertical just adopt it instantly overnight? I think um, it's one of those things that when you, we talk about um, what the healthcare environment demands, things like interoperability, cloud might sound like a really useful solution, but there you go, there's the big but. Regulation is inhibiting the data sharing there. So some of the challenges healthcare faces are around not being able to adopt technology because they can't in certain scenarios. Um, I really like what you've put there around uh, the, uh, the healthcare sector clients rarely want off the shelf. They want something to suit their specific needs. And that reminded me of my uh, point that I made, who's gonna argue with them? I remember dealing with database administrators who have, you know, it's almost like a black magic, black art they do with their database administration stuff. But that has impacts to IT and impacts to the business. The business wants to know that that system is online and healthy. The business wants to know that it's protected and recoverable. And, you know, there's cost implications of the system and the storage it consumes and things like that. DBAs rarely care about that sort of thing. They're just like, you want me to give you a great working database? That's what I'm going to give you. You talk to a healthcare professional, you want me to save lives, you're going to get me this system sort of thing, right? And, that, and I really like that last one, um, you know, that they're cunning and adaptable. They'll get their workarounds and, uh, you know, they'll get what they need from what they've got. So we've got to try and find that balance from an IT and a uh, healthcare and a business perspective. So I guess um, that's where we segue very nicely into my third question. Um, which is how do you balance the needs of patients and staff in such a heavily regulated industry? I mean, that's got to be the biggest challenge, right? It's such a heavily regulated industry. You want to satisfy the um, healthcare professionals, satisfy the patients, satisfy the business and satisfy the budget. Yeah, so I think we've, we've already made the point that there's a lot of regulation around mm -hmm. healthcare data, um, often with, with uh, criminal uh, sanctions for data breaches. Wow. Um, 
I guess uh, the other related point to that is that when you talk with health sector clients, clinical services people expect really high integrity and attention to detail from their vendors. And uh, you think, oh, you know, most of my customers do, but it's often more so in health. And the reason is the same as when we go to a doctor, we expect high integrity and attention to detail from them. So that's the way to think about it. That is the value set of the health sector is integrity and attention to detail. So if you say you're going to get back to a clinical manager next week, you better get back to them next week or they'll see you as unreliable. Um, if you uh, make a claim about your product or about uh, you know, what you're doing or, or what it will be able to do and it can't or it turns out that it doesn't, they'll see that as an integrity problem rather than just, a, oh, well, you know, we, we didn't quite get everything that we wanted out of the IT. Uh, this has been a big problem for IT because there's been a, a sense that IT overpromises and underdelivers in healthcare. And you're much better off uh, underpromising and overdelivering because of that value set of integrity and attention to detail that we expect of, of our clinicians. And uh, the, the other thing in terms of balancing the needs of patients and staff is talk with them. Consultation is really important for all clients, but for healthcare, it's crucial. And there's quite a few people to consult with. We're seeing more and more uh, patients involved in large scale uh, IT decisions and reviews. And these patients are becoming increasingly sophisticated. They may be retired uh, data professionals. They may be retired pharmacists. They may be uh, retired senior government uh, executives. Oh. And uh, so treating them just as a patient who's going to get the service, you know, whatever we serve up to them is no longer good enough. They'll be demanding to be consulted and they'll have a lot of really good points to make. They'll be quite sophisticated about it. You raise a and, really good point there. You're probably one of the only industries that really has the, not just a broad audience, the entire audience. Everyone at some point in their life will interact with healthcare at some point, it's guaranteed. Yes, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a it's a, a big field, you know, 10% of the total economy in, in Australia and 16% wow. of the total economy of the US. Um, I, I guess the, the overall... Um, point about balancing things is that the more capable and solid the back end of an IT system, the more the consultation can be about supporting the clinical service. And that's the conversation you want to be having with health sector clients is about patient care, not about the capability of your storage system or, or your um, uh, you know, communication, but interoperation between applications. Get that solid and then have the conversation about clinical care. And that's, that's a lot really of fun. It's a really, you know, it's, it's obviously my life, but it's, it's a pretty enjoyable and uh, worthwhile field to be working in. Uh, and, and look, you, you mentioned it there, right? it's important to listen. You listen to your clients, whether your clients are patients or the clinicians or, uh, you know, really understanding your challenges uniquely is exactly what we're setting out to do today with, with this very event is to kind of get a window into the world of healthcare. And uh, so, uh, you know, to kind of reiterate your points, um, you know, how do we balance the needs of patients and staff in such a heavily regulated industry? I think we're going to bring that up on screen now is... Uh, uh, you know, we've got to uh, realize that you have that uh, data governance, for lack of a better term, that's uh, the heavily regulated industry. So there are consequences for that. And uh, that will kind of, I guess, you know, impact a lot of your decision making. Um, and then from there, it flows down to, uh, you know, the expectations uh, around integrity. I don't know about you, but I, I guess um, if someone is handling my data, 
uh, and that data could have an impact on my life. Things like dosage of medication could could he help heal you or kill you. <laughs> I'd want that data integrity to be as tight as possible, uh, as well as the security. But then I also like your, um, uh, you know, that consultation is central. Listening to our customers, listening to the consumers of our data, the creators of our data, as well as the users of that data um, is extremely important. And I like what you said around, um, you know, ensuring that um, it's delivering the outcomes and focusing less on the features and capability. Uh, so that's brilliant. Well, look, this brings me to um, the last question I had for you today for this kind of portion of our um, conversation. And I was really interested in how um, technology has impacted the healthcare vertical. How has it changed healthcare and what can we expect in the future? Yeah, so there's, there's sort of two opposing answers to this. In some ways, technology doesn't change things. It doesn't change that, you know, there's going to be medicines, there's going to be surgery, um, there's going to be nursing care. But on the other hand, it changes everything. So I think the first point to make is that the IT industry can expect a large appetite for integration in the health sector because there's so many different applications. They've been running for so long. There's going to be legacy applications, you know, for as, until kingdom come. And there's also going to be unique client built systems. Uh, there'll be hodgepodges of, you know, what, when the fashion was for best of breed, it meant that we got a whole range of things that needed a, a, a big integration of the white space at that time. There's going to be very large systems, and um, that's probably at the moment the, uh, the swing is toward uh, integrated solutions. Um, but, you know, no solution does everything in healthcare. So it's about, you know, integration is going to be crucial. I guess the second point to make is that healthcare operates in very old institutions that are very slow to change. Our current uh, structure of hospitals goes back to the beginning of the 1800s. And, uh, you know, the, the departmental structure, the power structures, what doctors can do versus what nurses can do. Some of these things are uh, very old traditions. And if you come in with a business process map of, hey, look, we've suddenly worked out a different way of, of doing things and it's going to be much more efficient and it's going to be um, much better quality. There won't be an appetite for it if it crosses those old ingrained ways of thinking. You have to be sensitive to the history of the institutions. But on the other hand, at the technological frontier of healthcare, you are at the technological frontier of the modern world. There is more research going on with healthcare than any other field, including defence. Uh, if you look at, you know, the, the uh, research grants, um, publications, healthcare is right up there at the front. And at that frontier, the conceptual field is very, very fluid. And wow. uh, having a conversation with a professor one year, and then the same professor a year later, they'll be talking about different things because their thinking has moved on. Um, and vendors and regulators have trouble keeping up with these rapid conceptual developments at the technological frontier of, of healthcare. Um, and when you think of new modalities, so interventional radiology, I mean, it, it wasn't a thing when I did my wow. training. Yeah. more years ago than I care to admit. But, um, you know, they're, they're making up what they can do as they go forward. Cardiology was in the same space in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, many fields over and over, the, the development of uh, monoclonal antibody technology in cancer treatment and uh, autoimmune diseases has upended the mm. whole field. Um, I remember once uh, working with the National Health and Medical Research Council when we were changing the terminology of reading pap smears, you know, the, the wow. uh, pap smears to check for cervical cancer. Cervical cancer when, yeah. 
we realized that the cervical cancer was caused by a wart virus. Wow. And so the whole terminology had to change to fit in with those new discoveries. And over and over again in healthcare, we see this rapid conceptual development at the technological frontier, sitting on top of very deep historical strata, almost um, archeological in their age of things that just won't change in, in healthcare. Uh, so it's that tradition on the one hand versus the innovation on the other that vendors often have a, a trouble reconciling those two uh, intensely important ends of the healthcare field. So that's prob probably um, uh, a, a good way of answering where we think things are going. Yeah, great summary. And, and I think, um, you know, it kind of goes both ways, right? Healthcare is driving technology. Um, and, you know, it's uh, like you mentioned there, as with, with, with the evolutions of different technologies, they come back and kind of impact, um, you know, the kind of the traditional ways that things were handled in the healthcare industry. But then you've also got, um, you know, technology impacting healthcare. And uh, you know, I see what you've, you've put in, in your answers there when you talk about, uh, you know, this large appetite for integration. Um, we're getting wearable technologies now that are monitoring our heart rate, and, um, looking at our sleep patterns and things like that. We're generating more and more data than ever before. Um, and then uh, uh, I guess uh, in terms of technology shaping or changing um, the healthcare infrastructure, um, you know, you've got there, you've got, uh, you know, healthcare operates in old institutions. I think I remember you telling me the other week that um, some of the governing laws on um, uh, healthcare data is still based on paper and pencil when it was um, still physical um, records that were kept in our uh, filing cabinets and things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I really like your last point there, um, you know, that technological frontier, the field is very fluid. Um, you know, you've got reg regulators in the mix, vendors, you've got some um, different researchers coming in. Then you've got this global pandemic coming in and shaking everything up and trying to speed the whole process up. I think you, um, you nailed it on the head earlier when you said that um, there's more activity in healthcare, more research in healthcare, more data in healthcare than any other industry, including defense. Uh, I'm guessing that something like a global pandemic that literally impacts everyone on the planet um, will drive that activity and that global collaboration. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's uh, going to be a fantastic year for healthcare, I think, this year. Um, we're all looking forward to 2021 being better than 2020. But uh, within the uh, responses to the pandemic, uh, yeah. you know, we're all talking now about mRNA vaccines. Oh, yeah, you know, the Pfizer vaccine, oh, it'd be a bit more effective than the AstraZeneca there has never been an mRNA vaccine produced before for human use. It's a totally new technology for, for human consumption. And you know so, what? So can I just we get have... your professional opinion on something just now? No zombie apocalypse, right? This is the, this is the cure, right? We've been waiting for. Uh, well, we are rolling out the vaccine program before we know how long the immunity from it will last. Wow. Because we just have to wait for the passage of time to wow. uh, see that length of effectiveness. And, you know, humans will keep up with whatever the planet serves at us. And um, medicine is, uh, is right at the forefront of, of that, uh, that technology. And the IT technology is so enabling, so important for, for healthcare. Um, I mean, another example, if... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm on a bit of a break at the moment, but in February, I'll start my clinic again. I'll see my patients and we'll check their blood pressure. Yeah. And our patients are now offering us, they say, oh, you want to know what my blood pressure was? I've got it measured every day on my app for wow. um, the whole Christmas period. Do you want me to just download it to you? Here's all the data. Wow. Pretty new. Here's all the data. The wearables are finding even more intense uh, levels of, of data. And if they offer it to you, we're going to have to store it. We're going to have to access it. We're going to have to analyze oh, it. Absolutely, um, yeah. And under all the same stringent regulations that we've been talking about. Under the regulations, but hopefully some of the patterns that are emerging uh, across that wide range of data that we've got will help us look after people even better. Absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. Look after this, ourselves. Is, this is how that uh, 
I think collecting all that data and then leveraging technology like AI, which I'm about to talk about, um, to kind of find those patterns and do that statistical and um, I guess uh, some of the other data liquidity that you were talking about, the more that we can get that, I guess the more discoveries we can make and, and the faster they'll, they'll come. Yeah, cool. Thank so you, Paul, Paul, Chris, thank you. Uh, Paul, I share your personal optimism for uh, 2021. Um, I indeed uh, look forward to a, a brighter year. But, but with that said, you know, you kind of touched on it that 2020 and, and what we've learned and, and what that means for the healthcare industry, not just locally, but indeed hyper-connectivity globally, um, you know, it, it came at an opportune time, you know, in between the, the intersection, obviously, between technology availability and, and, and a, and a large-scale global demand. So um, thank you for sharing your insights. Um, a pleasure. Uh, attendees, Paul's going to stick around for a little while. Yes. So the chat function is still open. If you do have um, broad or even niche questions, feel free to throw them in there and um, we'll wrap up the end uh, with, with any questions you may have for Paul or Chris. So throw that in the chat function. Um, and, and we'll get onto it. But for now, we're going to hand over to Chris um, to talk about you know, how we can put some of these um, theories and, and, and concepts that the, the gentlemen were discussing into practice. Um, please welcome uh, NetApp's own uh, partner tech manager. It is Chris uh, Gonzo Gondek. That's right. Yep. Uh, Gonzo. And from now on, henceforth, we'll be always referred to as Gonzo. There's too many Chris's and Chris G's at NetApp. There's only one Gonzo. But uh, I'll just double check everyone can see my uh, presentation on screen right now. Yep, we got you, Chris. Fantastic. Awesome. So look, uh, uh, I just want to spend a little bit of time just kind of bringing uh, NetApp back into the conversation here. Um, we've been very lucky to get some of Paul's time to get insights into the challenges that the healthcare industry face. And one of the things that um, Paul mentioned throughout our conversation is really listening to your customers, listening to your clients uh, to understand their needs. We didn't want to just show up today and say, hey, we have a great solution um, for healthcare. Uh, what we wanted to do is show up today and say that uh, you know we understand what you're going through. We talk to a lot of our healthcare customers and partners and uh, consumers of healthcare technology, and we partner with a lot of healthcare technology vendors, which I'll talk about. But to kind of um, uh, reiterate what we have discovered throughout our journey with um, supplying solutions to healthcare providers for over 28 years, as, uh, as you saw how long NetApp's been around, um, we feel that we understand on certain levels the challenges, the consequences and the needs. So, um, you know, as Paul mentioned, the, the clinicians are in data overload. There's too much information, too much to process. So their needs are is the, the ease and the immediate access to the right data, but most importantly for the right people at the right time. We've got that heavily regulated industry kind of uh, watching over us and what we're doing with that data. So we want to collaborate, but we've got to do it carefully. Um, some of the consequences of not doing this right could impact lives, could be the wrong data falling into the wrong data sets, and then you have mistakes. And it's I don't I can't think of any other industry where the impacts are as severe as in the healthcare industry. Well, it will literally impact lives. Um, we do understand that innovation can be a challenge and associated with innovation is those exploding costs. Um, how do we meet those needs and supply the data to all of the right people at the right time by also um, making it in a regulated way? We look through the standardization. The more you can consolidate and simplify, remove complexity, the easier it is to manage and secure and deliver those services. And then the last one is around that demand for care is growing. Um, this... Uh, scenario that we're in where technology is improving healthcare and healthcare is influencing technology to kind of keep um, innovating means that we're all living longer and there's more of us demanding more from the healthcare service. So when the caregivers are inundated, when our hospitals can't uh, provide the infrastructure um, to the growing number of different types of illnesses and the number of um, uh, patients, how do we overcome that challenge? And the needs there are around streamlining workflows. If uh, you can automate processes and get them uh, down to a very efficient uh, cycle, then it has an overall positive impact on the operation of the environment, but also the cost. So to try and put these into a bit more, um, I guess, specific trends, we understand the broader trends throughout the healthcare industry. Um, 
you know, Paul mentioned a lot about interoperability. So the advancements specifically in the electronic uh, medical record systems are around interoperability, around being able to um, satisfy the patient needs, but also give collaboration. Um, AI is going to play a big role in this, this digital analytics capability, um, sifting through all that data, doing the um, statistical analysis and the categorical analysis. Um, virtual care, mobile apps and IoT, Paul mentioned about the wearables. We can come in with our healthcare app and give our GP or our specialist all of our um, you know, information. Um, that could speed up the process. It could also introduce other challenges as we spoke about. And that leads us to cybersecurity. Um, the more data that we generate, in fact, the more sensitive and personal data that we generate, the more we need to be focused around security. That data falls into the wrong hands. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, the consequences can be quite um, significant, uh, not just from a personal data perspective, but even from uh, you know, privacy laws and things like that. So that brings us to the, the regulatory space. We, we work with and understand uh, a lot of our uh, partners and customers and prospects in different countries in different states within countries that have different um, regulations and laws, but there's other things that have that have become emerging around that. You can see their next generation payment models, so health subscription services. Um, the consumer experience is improving. We're probably more in control with electronic health records. Um, this concept of holistic individual health. Um, you know, Paul even said it himself that uh, there's been advancements in the way that um, uh, data is collected about. Um, an individual from a specific uh, department, let's say cardiology, um, can now be mixed with other departments and GPs and that sort of thing. And then suddenly you find this, um, well, if we make these connections, this individual has seen these three different specialists, that's actually triggered this scenario that if we didn't have those three bits of data. And that comes down to that accessible points of care as well. So lastly, financial uh, performance is important. I think in every country, we all realize that um, hospitals do get a generous amount of funding, but also uh, that funding uh, is very quickly, I'm sure Paul will attest to this, distributed and very quickly runs out. And then some departments are kind of left um, without being able to get access to that funding. So if we can make more better use of that funding and streamline it, and um, uh, get those uh, kind of uh, services running more efficiently, then that becomes better for the end user, this cost and transparency. I don't know about you guys, but when I go to the um, surgeon and he says, okay, well, this is what it's gonna cost for me. I can't tell you what the hospital costs are gonna be or the anesthetist or these other bits and pieces. And you're like, well, you know, how big is a ball of string? Do I need 10K, 20K, 30K? All of this, uh, all of these trends are kind of emerging and improving in healthcare. So. Where do we come in? Where does NetApp fit into this? In a lot of the healthcare services and systems globally, there are kind of three major areas that we play in and we see that um, healthcare um, has major areas in technology investment. The first one is in el electronic health records. And you can see some of the vendors there, Epic, Meditech, Intersystems, um, Cerner. Um, we are very much partnered with these technology providers and we work in conjunction with each other and co-develop solutions with each other. In the medical imaging space, uh, when you hear terms like PACS and DICOM and these different um, uh, imaging uh, technologies and things like vendor neutral archiving and things like that, Again, some of the uh, names here, when I first looked at them, I, it made me think back to the 90s and my camera that I used to develop the film for. Of course, these would be the companies that uh, you know, are in the medical imaging space and probably would have been at the forefront of uh, developing this type of technology. And then lastly, um, still kind of emerging, but more and more so, I think even being driven on by the pandemic, the concept of artificial intelligence and using AI, machine learning, neuro-linguistic programming technologies uh, to speed up healthcare research and uh, 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 finding things like a, uh, a good vaccine in the current circumstances that we're in. So the message I want to get across here is these are all key strategic partners for NetApp. We work very closely with these partners. You saw the video at the beginning. We aren't experts in that field, but we are experts in providing the data management to your field. So... To look at things from a technology perspective, if we've got any technology folks um, you know, watching the session today or on board, this is what a typical uh, larger healthcare environment looks like. You have multiple departments there and each department has their own uh, applications that could be delivered by one or more different specific vendors. And then you have your traditional IT needs on the right there, NAS and SAM, which is network attached storage and storage, attached, uh, storage area networks. 
And so you've got your traditional IT needs because there are other obviously supporting staff and systems in a hospital. Then you've got your very specific systems here. All of them tend to be application-based silos, different hardware, different software, different people, different processes. It's all there. The challenges there are around not being able to collaborate. Um, maybe even if you are allowed to, you're bound by the systems. So in a very kind of short nutshell, what I want to get across today is this is where we play a very specific role with NetApp. We provide this concept of the agile shared infrastructure. And it's not just in data centers, it's across public clouds and private clouds and managed service providers. What we're looking to do is to give you any workload, any protocol through the NetApp data fabric, that single platform. I'm not gonna go into too much technical detail here, but you do see uh, through the one operating system, all of the different ways that data can be served, SIFS NFS, uh, iSCSI fiber channel, even S3 object storage, and uh, uh, that sort of uh, interaction with data is completely available through the one platform. Now that really helps for things like EHR, for imaging, for analytics, genomics. Um, you can see some of the uh, points down the bottom there, the common architecture. Uh, most importantly, one of the things that um, Paul pointed out to me is that uh, uh, the healthcare industry and, and researchers and data scientists would favor data lookup over migration. They would rather not have to lift and shift and move data around um, in favor of being able to access all of the repositories. Those data repositories might need to live somewhere geographically or departmentally for a reason, but having access to all of them simultaneously uh, is a big advantage. So a good example of this, um, I have one specific example that I wanna talk about is around Epic. Um, Epic is in the EHR and medical imaging space. And it's one of those uh, solutions that's well known specifically in the healthcare industry. And they have this thing called the honor roll. And the honor roll assesses uh, technologies in about 52 different categories, major categories, uh, really puts them through a stringent test. And uh, NetApp has, exceeded the Epic Honor Roll. And we're the only vendor that has a high comfort rating for both our SAN and NAS storage solutions. So apart from the fact that Epic has put us through their stringent test and said, yes, these guys can deliver everything. On top of that, we're still very cost conscious. One of the things that we do in every industry, but more specifically here for Epic is we give a five to one data reduction, but hundred percent availability. That means I can do everything that I want to do and deliver my services, but I can significantly reduce the cost and consumption. We're the only vendor approved to consolidate all of the Epic workloads into a single platform. And we reduce things like um, data protection, recovery, business continuity. You can see there from 14 hours down to under 10 minutes. So there's multi-dimensional benefits here just from one of the uh, healthcare vertical partners that we partner with. To kind of visualize what I'm talking about here, Here's an example of what a specific Epic environment would look like. You have a number of different um, repositories and data silos on different systems with different applications. Uh, like, like we mentioned in the previous slide, we're the only vendor that can consolidate all of those workloads through a single and easy to use platform that will serve out the data through the multiple protocols to the multiple uh, departments leveraging that while maintaining security, while maintaining integrity, and uh, most importantly, delivering that data liquidity that uh, Paul was speaking of earlier. So I have only two more um, slides that I'd love to share with you today because I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the broader NetApp capability uh, around what is the data fabric. Yes, we have very compelling solutions with our healthcare provider partners, but we are also the specialists in hybrid multi-cloud. Whether you're running workloads in a data center or any one of the multiple public clouds or you're staying in a hybrid kind of mix, especially if you're sharing research data with other um, entities and universities and other hospitals and things like that. We are providing that data fabric. The data fabric is what's serving those data services to any environment that you live in with the same experience, uh, the same user experience, and uh, most importantly, those same levels of service, security, and uh, the efficiencies that we get. So the one example that I'm going to leave you with today before I, we get to questions and uh, my last slide, uh, if you have a look at this, um, I think someone may post the link in the chat. Um, this is a story that was published literally this month, just a, a, about a week and a half ago, around how AstraZeneca uh, was challenged, their big challenge was around um, consolidating and sharing data between their data center and all four clouds. 
uh, and how they did it with NetApp, how they managed to get the data out to the data scientists that needed to get access so that they could speed up the process. We've never been hit with a global pandemic like this before. The pressure that was put on uh, the healthcare providers to speed up the process of trials, of adverse reaction data, that's a big deal. You know, they need to know who's having adverse reactions to a supposed vaccine. Is it safe? These trials would usually take, you know, two to three years and they had to speed this up, you know, with, with a few months. Um, so I think it's a very compelling story. I invite you to go out and, and have a read about it and hear about how uh, this particular healthcare uh, customer federated their data with their partners and their research institutes across Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, uh, as well as their own data centers to uh, uh, develop the uh, COVID-19 treatments and therapies. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for um, taking the time to listen to me today. Um, I'll hand it back to our host, Andrew, and uh, see if we have uh, any questions from the audience. Thanks, Godzo. Appreciate that. And it's very uh, apt that I guess you ended on that case study as well, given um, you know, Paul's comments before about what 2021 is, is going to look like for us um, as patients and, and for the two of you, in, obviously, in the industry. So I do have a question here um, that was submitted to me. Um, I guess it's probably more around, you know, you've got so much experience, Paul. So given the many different hats that you've had to wear in so many different parts of um, not just many organisations, but but inside of um, you know singular in, uh, organisations. Um, I guess, do you have like a top tip for um, the people on the call as you've kind of navigated um, your career path that might be applicable um, to the work that, that kind of Gonzo was going through and 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 some of the tech work that our attendees will be doing. Look, uh, it's hard to summarize, but I, I guess I'd make a, a similar point that um, people know about in their personal life. If you want to make friends, don't tell them about yourself. Ask them about them. So if you're working in IT in healthcare, try and understand the health services that you're working in. Try and understand what their problems are in the patient care, what the opportunities are for, for making people better, you know, really understand their environment, their problems, and uh, then do the work yourself of thinking, well, how can um, my company or uh, my department um, try and help with that? If you uh, go in trying to get the uh, clinician managers advice about how to improve your IT services they'll probably tell you a few things but it's not going to help the friendship uh, tell you to take a, a long walk off a short pier as we'd say in Australia <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant I guess um I guess on that and and and, and you know that, that's all part of the Amplify series as well and and getting to hear some of those external point of views um, and to deep dive in. So again, if, if anyone does have a, another question for Paul, please feel free to submit it. Um, I do have a few that's been um, sent to me um, for you, Chris, but I don't know if you wanted to not so much retort, but respond to, to Paul's comment there with, with maybe your own um, top tip for, for how you, you know, I, how you I, know this crazy, crazy world. I think Paul's top tip there works for anyone in any industry that's trying to deliver a service or a solution or a product. Listening is the number one skill I've learned to, uh, um, I guess, uh, improve as I've gotten older in my career. We talk about, you know, skills I can go out and study a technology, but the soft skills you kind of only learn through experience. And I remember very distinctively um, when I first started out as a systems engineer, going out to meetings with my account manager, she'd literally have to kick me under the table to get me to shut up and stop and just listen, <laughs> listen to what, our customers are telling us. We're so excited to rush in and uh, evangelize our technology. But uh, what is the point if that technology isn't specifically solving your problems and addressing your challenges and your needs? I think it's it's definitely the best advice you could give anyone in their career as well as uh, to a vendor. I guess that makes sense. And I've, I've had a question here direct to you, Chris, but I think it actually might be opportune to kind of bring Paul into it as well. Um, the question is from... Um, one of our attendees just asking how important is it to adopt a single patient record system 
Um, you know, when you think about, I guess, you know, the healthcare ecosystem, having the right technology and speed to diagnose, and ultimately, you know, we're trying to improve patient outcomes. Um, I know that you're going to have a solution, um, Gonzo, to that problem, but Paul probably has some real world experience on the other side of that. So I'd be super keen to, to hear maybe a bit of a conversation um, around. Absolutely. Look, I'll start by saying with uh, a technical guy's hat on, uh, someone who has designed and deployed solutions globally, um, I would even say how important is it to have a single system for anything that we're doing? As soon as you go beyond one system, that increases complexity. It increases the uh, administrative overhead of that system. Now, you might have very good reasons to physically separate or even logically segregate um, certain data sets and things like that. But um, I think the importance from an infrastructure perspective is driving down complexity, which drives down costs. And it also reduces risk. I have one system to protect. I have one system to recover. Some people may say that one system is a single source of failure, but then you make that system highly available. Um, that's a very infrastructure mindset answer to that question. I'd definitely love to hear what Paul would say around, um, you know, the healthcare vertical maintaining one system for patient records. <laughs> what a loaded question to throw at you, Paul. Let's see how many friends or enemies you can make. <laughs> well, look, I guess uh, debate is always good. And I guess my answer to that would be um, one system in your dreams. <laughs> Let's just see how it actually works in practice. So the only person in our hospital with one health record is a baby born today. Wow. They get born today, they get a new record created for them, you know, baby of Mrs. Jones. And that's their only health record. Except that there's probably one in their general practice where they were not yet born. And then the next day, a record is sent to the registrar of births, deaths and marriages. So they get a next health record. And if you think, well, is that really a health record? Yes, it is, because those registers, they are the denominator for the cancer registries for any of our cancer care is using those public registries. And then as soon as they uh, reach two months of age, they have a vaccine. First inoculation, that's right. Yep. And they get registered on the national vaccination register. And then that's copied over to their patient controlled or parentally controlled electronic health record uh, held by the Australian uh, government. So by two months of age, the baby is in four different uh, health records. Um, I guess if we can reframe the question and if it, the question is, is it important to minimize the number of uh, electronic health records that a, a patient has, I would say yes, because they're so easy for them to proliferate. I don't think you'll ever get it down to one, um, but um, uh, keep it as minimal as possible is a, a good uh, approach. Can I just say something really quickly, Paul, there? You've, um, you've sparked a, an interesting idea. Um, you know, we talk about data and health data and relevant data to us. Um, would it be fair to say that the healthcare industry, that's the first place we get data, like you say, when we're born? Could it also be the last place we make a data entry? Maybe our death certificate or something <laughs> like that? <laughs> Controversial. Well, uh, uh, it, it, it could well be. There's uh, there data. Our data the journey starts with healthcare and ends with healthcare throughout our lifetime. I love it. There you go. Uh, the uh, the lifeblood um, of, of indeed the healthcare industry. I guess, um, Paul, you mentioned there, you know, streamlining um, the number of systems maybe is, is more the, the, the goal there versus uh, a single user. And I guess that provides us with a really nice uh, segue, Gonzo, um, into kind of explaining um, the differences, I guess, between a hybrid and a multi-cloud environment in, in that space and some of the opportunities and challenges that are available to, to people in the industry. 
That is a brilliant question. And it's uh, something that I do consider myself to be a bit of a dedicated specialist in. I've, I've dedicated my entire career predominantly to IT infrastructure and data. How does data um, flow over infrastructure? In fact, um, I use the term infrastructure evolution a lot. When computers first came about, they were big, large systems, they bespoke systems, mainframe systems. Then they became uh, kind of smaller systems that would fit into a data center, which then became virtual infrastructure. Then cloud came along, and now we're right down to serverless architecture and containers. The one thing that has remained consistent throughout that infrastructure evolution is data. Data is what is the currency that's flowing around that infrastructure. So you, we then, I usually start a lot of conversations with what is hybrid cloud. The concept of hybrid cloud started out as I have a data center that can burst its operations to a public cloud. And then multi-cloud was traditionally known as multiple hyperscaler environments and Amazon, a Google, a Microsoft. And so when you take the two together, hybrid, multi-cloud, what you're talking about is every infrastructure anywhere where data can live. I may own and operate one and multiple physical data centers and remote offices. I may have some workloads and data sets handled for me by a managed service provider in a hosted facility, or I may be using multiple clouds. A lot of our customers find themselves already in this hybrid multi-cloud state. In fact, you ask them, say, are you doing anything in the cloud? Oh, no, but they have Office 365 and they've probably got Adobe Online and they've probably got uh, NetSuite and these other solutions that are already in the cloud. So really, I guess the, the conversation there is around when you focus on the data, the infrastructure should, shouldn't should matter. And the way that NetApp helps to achieve that is by providing that same experience, the same data fabric, which we call on tap. It doesn't matter if you find it in the data center or if you pull it down from the marketplace in Azure or if you deploy it in Google Cloud, it is the same product with the same experience and therefore by design and by definition, interoperable, which is what uh, Paul was talking about in our very first conversation around what makes healthcare data so different to corporate data is that uh, you know they, they ha effectively have this dependency on this interoperability, which we have delivered by design since the moment that we were founded. Yeah, makes sense. And I guess, and thank you, Sean Scott, for um, the question, which probably segues a little more into, you know, um, uh, I guess well, the next the next phase um, in 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 those systems and, and and processes is how much is AI playing a role for healthcare in Australia is specifically the question, but I guess um, that would extend into New Zealand as well, Gonzo, with your territory. So I'd be keen to hear your thoughts. Chris, on, um, on that question, mainly from a back-end um, perspective, then it'd be really helpful to hear from Paul, um, you know, how some of those solutions are impacting everyday operations in, in the healthcare industry. And, and this is why I love having these types of conversations, because from a back-end infrastructure perspective, we put these technology solutions together, but then we get someone like Paul to come in and go, all right, um, I'm, I'm going to show you how to use this thing. Um, if I'm doing some medical research for a vaccine for a pandemic, for example, I'm going to feed it tons and tons of data, which would normally take researchers, however many millions of human research hours to sift through results and make these calculations. From an infrastructure perspective, I think in the past, historically, it's been the, the barriers to entry, we call it. A barrier to entry might be, I would love to do some AI, but my out-of-pocket costs up front to do that are going to be X million dollars. Then along came the cloud and said, hey, you can switch on AI and BigQuery and things like that in our cloud environment. Um, and we'll only bill you for when you're running your number crunching and your calculations, which makes it more accessible. Then the challenge becomes around, well, how do I feed it all the data that it needs? How do I get it from all of my repositories? Do I need to create an, an additional data lake and pull data out from other repositories and put into that one? Or can I point the AI technology at my data repository? and do it very quickly and more cost effectively to get those outcomes. So we understand the challenges around the infrastructure concept of AI. And in fact, we have partners who are delivering AI as a service um, with uh, our alliance partners like NVIDIA, for example, um, here in Australia and New Zealand based on NetApp systems, where we serve the data ultra fast, get those results quicker, and we don't have to lift and shift a lot of data around to feed these systems. But uh, yeah, Paul, absolutely keen to hear on how, uh, you know, 
the AI technology is then you know having these impacts in healthcare. Oh, and it's 2020. You're on mute. That's the quote of 2020. No, 2021 now. Jeez. <laughs> I I think uh, the you know the the first point that has been made right through this presentation is that there is a lot of healthcare data. Healthcare is big data, and um, I think the idea that, ah, oh, look, you know, you just mine the big data and you'll get huge healthcare advances, it's just not going to work like that. Um, it, was, uh, a, it was a sort of a fake offering. Um, artificial intelligence, similarly, we've got to remember it's, it's a metaphor. It is real intelligence. It's not artificial. It's been programmed. It, it does what it does as a particular program. And uh, so, for example, the, uh, an artificial intelligence that is directed toward playing games um, and beating other artificial intelligence chess playing engines is not going to be the same one that is going to have the best conversation with a patient about their troubling symptoms today. That might be a, a have an artificial intelligence within it, but it will be quite different. So I think we're going to see a proliferation of what sort of intelligence, what sort of uh, capability do the various artificial intelligence programs offer. Uh, and I think uh, we've got to always realize that intelligence itself is hybrid. No, there's no such thing as an isolated genius. The geniuses that we've recognized through history were parts of their milieu. They talked to people, they impressed people, they took it all in. And it's the same with, with uh, machine intelligence. It's only as good as the conversations that it can have. It's only as good as the interactions it can have with real people, whether they be a, a professor of imaging radiology or whether it be a patient who's trying to get the best out of their last eight weeks of life. Um, intelligence is always about strong communication and uh, context dependence. Yeah, it makes sense, I guess. But it's Chris, interesting you mentioned there artificial intelligence. I almost call it, it's an artificial human. I mean, all we're doing is getting machines to do our work at a much more rapid pace, dealing with more data than we could ever on our own. Um, and, and we even use brain terminology, neuro-linguistic programming, training computers to think like a human brain, but at a much faster pace with all of the power, the processing power um, that they have available. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an exciting frontier, Chris. Um, and without getting into an ethical conversation, as it were, you know, what are some of the projections that you see in this hyper-regulated environment, some of those projected challenges um, that you see in this space that people kind of need to be planning for now? I have one that um, I'd love to get Paul's perspective on. And I remember when the first Bluetooth toothbrush came out and it was, uh, I know it sounds, sounds awesome, but it was a Bluetooth toothbrush. I thought, why does my toothbrush need a wireless networking communication technology? I get my Oral-B app and I've got my Bluetooth toothbrush and it's probably keeping track of how often I'm brushing to to tell me when to change the bristles and that sort of thing. And then I thought to myself, hang on, will that data ever make it back to my insurance company will, who will then increase my dentist premium if I'm not brushing enough? Or will I get rewarded, for example, because I'm brushing properly and therefore my insurance premium goes down? I think that's one of my biggest concerns and impacts for the future with healthcare and data in healthcare and more data being shared. Um, that and, you know, when you kind of send one of your DNA swabs off to uh, Ancestry, Dot com who, who owns your genetic data from that point onwards what are they allowed to do with it after that you know am i predisposed to heart disease and they'll give that to the insurance companies um i know it's probably a very uh controversial conversation that we've had for some time now but keen to get paul's uh, input on them it'll continue on right and i guess paul is you know as a practitioner out there um what are some of those challenges um that you're seeing that you know maybe either sides of the industry need to be working on well, look, I think Chris is bringing up the question of trust and integrity. And uh, healthcare is always going to be, have a place a very, very high value on trust and integrity and on um, attention to detail. Um, crowdsourcing from my symptoms, I'm not so keen on. 
crowdsourcing for um, you know better design of, of cars to crash less I like that uh, so there's never going to be one ethical answer and there, there will always be um, controversy uh, about it as well I mean there, yeah. there is a, a company now uh, that is collecting people's symptoms and what their chronic disease is and they are looking at crowdsourcing big data for them to then offer solutions. Well, wow. we know that their solutions is going to come in the form of advertising to the people that contribute. Yeah, Some people yeah. might be okay with that. Mm. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't mind it on my traffic apps when, um, uh, you know, I get told, ah, oh, you're running low on petrol and there's a Caltex coming up. Um, that's pretty helpful. But um, I'm not sure that giving people my symptomatology and then being told there's a product for you uh, coming from, from one of our uh, family of companies. Uh, and it's the same, you know, it's, the, it's, a, it's an ex ways uh, CEO who is now building wow. this chronic disease app. There's a lot of questions to be asked. There's a lot of um, uh, problems for it. And my answers are going to be different than my children's answers. Um, they're going to be a lot more comfortable with uh, data sharing. On the other hand, they're probably going to be um, a lot less gauche in, in uh, the approaches to each other than, than uh, some of my generation have been. And uh, we've, we've got to um, move with the, with the times and we've got to see how all this works in conversations with each other in sensitivity and in high trust um, conversations. Love it. Trust and integrity. It makes sense. You know, 2021 is exciting proposition to be kind of diving into that stuff. Before we, before we wrap, Gonzo, um, there are some giveaways still to come. Um, I just wanted to ask one final question, uh, which is probably really relevant to some of the, the, the customers and, and prospects on, on the call is, you know, what are some of those um, either unique or common challenges you're seeing um, as, as they kind of navigate CapEx and OpEx budgets, um, you know, for either subscribing or, or, or navigating, how do we, how we plan ahead for our CapEx and OpEx um, now? And, and what are the, some of the challenges that, um, you know, that, that people are facing? It's a, it's a brilliant question because, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about how uh, technology makes an impact, not just to the healthcare sector, but to all businesses. When cloud computing came along, uh, this concept of subscription services suddenly emerged. And we all know that historically IT has been a large capital expenditure exercise. We think for a long time, we plan for a long time, we design and deploy with a big heavy investment um, and plan for a system to be online for us for the next ideally 10 years if possible. Um, this was referred to as monolithic architecture applications. With the advent of cloud, it's not just the um, barrier to entry in that, that I can just switch on a subscription service. I'm effectively renting someone else's infrastructure. It's also the way we've evolved in how we are developing our software. So instead of buying um, big celebrated releases and versions of an operating system or an application every couple of years, we now just subscribe to one and automatically get the updates. I think a good example would be, um, you know, if you buy, for example, Windows for your computer, there was Windows 8 and Windows 10, you bought the new version because you got new features. Um, different to that would be the, you know, Facebook app on your phone. You don't know what version it is. It might have been updated last night. It might have been updated last week. All you care about is that you have this functional uh, software and that's being maintained and operated by someone else and you just subscribe to it. Whether it's a free app and you know you submit your information for their advertising purposes, or it's a service that you subscribe to. I think um, th the advent of cloud has changed our expectations on how we will consume infrastructure and it helps us plan better for the future. I think you um, hinted at that. If I can get a subscription service where I know what the fixed costs are gonna be monthly for the next 24 to 36 months, um, and it's going to be a fraction of what it would be for a large capital expenditure investment, then I would go for that model. It's different, however, for service providers who may want to get a profit margin from that investment and on-sell the service. 
So they could either do it in a very safe way and say, I want a subscription service and I'll put my margin on top, or they can see how much consumers they're going to have of the service, make the CapEx investment, and then all of the profit margin belongs to them, no matter how many people they onboard after. There is still a really good argument um, for both sides, either a CapEx or an OpEx. The good news is that whichever way you want to go with NetApp, uh, we've got you covered in both scenarios. Uh, you can consume our technology in a subscription model, or you can still uh, purchase upfront if desired. I mean, it's great. It's a great segue to kind of wrap up there, and I'm sure that many people are probably, you know, if not uh, starting off their yearly budgets now, um, well underway. So, um, thank you, Gonzo. Thank you, Paul, um, for that. We do have some giveaways um, to to give to the attendees um, over and above the kind of trivia um, today. So, I'm going to flash a QR code up here um, to get just a, some short feedback, or there will be a URL in the chat. Um, to give your feedback. Uh, there'll be a small token of appreciation, of course, as is always the case for these kinds of things. And I genuinely want to thank you, gentlemen. Um, yeah, I've been involved in and hosted uh, many of these different um, kinds of sessions and, and we're three sessions into the Amplify series now. And, and I can say without a doubt that, you know, this has been the most engaging um, uh, of, of the series so far. And I look forward to the Amplify series kind of ramping up um, from here, as it were. Um, Paul, Doug Dale is the Associate Professor of Public Health and Director of the Centre for Health Stewardship at the Australian National University. Joining him today was Chris Gondek, the Technical Part Manager for NetApp. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, thank you to the attendees. Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone from right across Asia Pacific. This has been the NetApp Amplifier Series, Deep Diving to Healthcare. Have a great day. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Paul. All the best. Thank you.